Hello, welcome to Lemmy Studios, home of the Lemmy vs. Limey games. I'm your official Zeke Lamont, and today they face off in the fourth Paranormal Activity movie. <sighs> After three, a lot of people thought they were done, including me, but with these types of movies being so cheap to make, and making such a profit off of them after the very first day, of course they're going to continue on to make them. This fourth one takes place in 2011, making it the first true sequel to the Paranormal Activity franchise. We follow Alex, who is played by Catherine Newton, who has the best career out of all of the people who have ever acted or performed in a Paranormal Activity movie. And we also follow her counterpart, Ben, who is played by Matt Shively, who is her boyfriend without the title, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, they're, they're not official, but... They like each other. With this type of movie being the lowest ranking on Rotten Tomatoes thus far and being very divisive amongst fans today, where is it going to land on the limit scale? Well, let's find out. We kick off with beat time as Katie is giving Hunter a bracelet. And this whole cold open here is basically a previously on Paranormal Activity as this shows the ending of the second one with Katie killing Christy and kidnapping Hunter. Um, and I'm honestly conflicted here because... I can see why you would want to do a previously on because it's been two years since the second movie came out since this is the first true sequel. I mean, yes, the second one was a sequel, but only for like the last five minutes. Um, so to give that previously on just, you know, to give everyone a quick uh, recap. Yeah, I can see that. But however, we are four movies in at this point. If people are still going to see panel activity movies. Aren't they fans? Like, aren't they invested and they are kind of aware of everything that is going on? I would say so, but you could bring that friend that's like, yeah, no, come see this movie. You don't really need to see the others to, cap to uh, follow along and all that stuff. So, I don't know. I see both sides and y'all like high scoring, so I'm going to give a score to both Lemmy and Limey. <laughs> We now fast forward to 2011 in Henderson, Nevada, and after our hard fought game, we meet our little MVP, Wyatt, and who is so upset that his dad's not showing up that he just spends his frustrations until he shows up. And, okay, I get recording the football game, or soccer game, depending on where you are, but why are you recording lunch? <laughs> on the way home, we see the same kid that we saw earlier who was watching the soccer slash football game. And then Alex and Wyatt are playing putt-putt inside the house. And oh my god. Man, if I used one of those cups, I would have got my butt kicked. I had to use those 7-Eleven cups. Uh, not a mug like this. Like, this is ceramic. That's at least 20 bucks. I mean, could easily break that. Although, 20 bucks is probably not much to this family. This is about as upper class as you can get. This house is absolutely gorgeous. Ben lets himself inside the house and asks Alex when the parents are leaving so they can party. It's not a party. It's just like a kickback. Hey, she said the thing! You see, YouTube was not my first home. I first started on SoundCloud, and I had this show called The Lemon Kickback, where I talked about a bunch of movie news. And now I have brought that here to YouTube. I'll leave a link to the description below if you want to check it out. While they clean up, this is where we get the better understanding of the relationship between Alex and Ben. They are basically a couple without a title, as I said before. Uh, you could tell because like they're not calling each other boyfriend or girlfriend. There's even the scene later on where she's like, oh, he's my best friend and all that. He's like, you're calling me your best friend? And all that kind of stuff. Just that young love type thing. Uh, he just needs to ask her out or she does. So, you know, I, I don't digress on either side asking the other out. And I can tell that she likes him and he likes her because, you know, he does the hand on the leg thing. And she goes, bah. you know, she's like, I mean, she... It's like a sheep. <laughs> and she approved it. I mean, and also a lemme to Ben for making sure she was okay with him doing that. I think that is a lesson for all boys to learn and also for men like me to learn. They go to the playhouse where Robbie is, who is the kid that we saw earlier and who is the neighbor's new kid across the street. And then we get a little exposition song about it later. And this doesn't mean anything to the story, but I'm going to give a limey to everyone involved in this movie. Because in this song, Alex says that he plays in her treehouse, where it's clearly not a treehouse. It's a playhouse, as they said earlier. Like, why couldn't they catch that? You know, it's just a simple line. Sure, a lot of people maybe, like, just let it go over their head and probably didn't even think about it once, or even twice. Hell, it took me five times watching this movie for me to finally realize it. 
So, yeah, no. It may go over other people's heads, but not here at Lemon Studios. Ooh. Later that night, Alex and Ben are FaceTiming until an ambulance arrives at Robbie's house. Now that Robbie's mom is stuck in the hospital for a little bit, Robbie is going to be staying with Alex's family. Now, I would be given a limey here, but they actually gave a pretty good explanation for it. It's not worthy of a lemmy or anything, but it's just Robbie doesn't have any family now, so they're basically stuck with him. Not worthy of a lemmy, but not worthy of a limey either because they attempted to explain it. However, I am going to give a limey for, you know, when they had Robbie unpacking his whole bag and then there's this fork. This fork shows up and he says, this fork can tell the future. And a lot of people were like speculating about this fork, but it turns out that the director and the writers just let this kid riff. <laughs> and that means that they just let him improv what these items meant. And yeah, <laughs> look, I get the script structure. I, I do. A lot of improv is applied to the script structure, but you don't have the kid riff. I mean, at least they are not introducing a fork that can tell the future. I mean, what's next? Time travel? <laughs> that would be crazy. There ain't no way panel activity will introduce time travel. Alex and Ben are FaceTiming again, and Alex hears some noises and the front door open alarm. So she goes to investigate, and it's a very, very long still shot. And you see Robbie's shadow run across it in the background for a little bit. And then Alex jump scares into frame. It is an effective jump scare, but I am still going to give a limey for it. Because panel activity is better than doing just random jump scares. Again, very effective, but lazy. Anyone can do that. The next day, Ben shows Alex Robbie coming into her room and cuddling with her onto the bed and sleeping with her pretty much. And later that day, we see Robbie and Wyatt playing in the Treehouse Playhouse. And this is where Robbie introduces us to his imaginary friend. You know him. You love him. Unless your name is Michael Scott, it's Toby Flanderson from HR. Alex pretends that she can see him, but Robbie's like, nah. He's like John Cena. You can't see him. And I gotta say here... I am really digging the Robbie character. You know, just the way he dresses, his cadence, and the way he talks and line delivery. He's just a really creepy kid overall. They slide down and we get the triangle circle symbol in the sand. And later that night, Ben shows everyone a very cool feature that you can do on the Xbox Connect. There's a bunch of little dots and spec specs everywhere so you can get your motions and all that. And the nighttime, you can only see it in the infrared camera. And this is where they have a dance party! And while afterwards they get done, Ben and Alex review the footage and they see a human-like shape next to Robbie like having a conversation. And I gotta say, it's pretty cool. How did they do that? That's the coolest thing I have ever seen. We are now 20 minutes in and it's our official night one. And okay, look, I let it go for the trilogy. Because it was kind of its own thing, and I just took it as, like, it's its own police investigation type of thing. I was like, you know what? I'll let it go. There is somewhat of an explanation. Now, here, I'm going to give a limey for the night cards. Um, because, look, in the first movie, it's very effective. It is shot as if this was actual found footage. Um, police said we thank people for letting us see it. Or Paramount thanked the police in this uh, and the families for watching it. And every night had a extra umph to it. You know, first night with the camera with Mika. Okay, night one, we get it. But then it keeps going. Night 13, night 20. And you feel like, damn, they've been doing this for 20 days. It has a really big impact on it. Now, four movies in, this night card means nothing to me. You could put night 40 and I'll be like, okay. <laughs> so what? Like, I know this is not real anymore. Like how the first one had that ability to it. Again, for the second and third one, I let it go because you could be like, okay, well, they found the VHS tapes. Or uh, the second one, like, oh, yeah, this is part of this investigation that we had with Katie. So, yeah, for the first three, I could let it go. But now, like, this is just random footage at this point. It means nothing to me. Lighting. Anyways, we finally get some paranormal activity when Alex asks Robbie, hey, who are you talking to? He says, nobody. Then we get a flash of light and some footsteps. And that's all we get for that night. 
Alex and Ben try to show her dad the footage that they caught, but he thinks they just edited something. And I've gone long enough. These parents suck. Uh, the characters, not the actors. Um, but, I mean, how disconnected from your children you have to be to not see how creeped out she is. How she's like, no, dad, this is real. And it's also the mom. Uh, Align me to these parents. It, they're, I mean, yeah, they're somewhat believable parents because I could see parents being disconnected from their kids. Like, oh, you kids with your technology and all that stuff. But man. Another FaceTime call ends when Ben returns the jump scare with Dragon Alex across the bed. While they fight, we see Robbie is doing the KD stand and stare. After they make up, we get the most non-believable camera setup in this whole entire franchise. She has set up all the laptops to constantly record everything. And there's no way, I don't care how much money you make, those laptops are not going to hold that much storage 24-7. They're just not. Ooh. And Ben is saying keep the Xbox on. 24-7. Really, Ben? This is 2011. This is one year after the Red Ring of Death debacle. You really gonna trust that Xbox on 24-7? At night, we see Robbie and Wyatt playing downstairs at 3 a.m. until his mom comes downstairs and turns on the light and... Whoa! Rewind there for a second. That's Toby leading the charge! <laughs> Holy crap! Guys, I just got goosebumps from that. You know, I, like I said in the third movie, I love realizing things were creepy after the fact that they happened. Alex gets back to school and Toby wants to play basketball. But when Alex declines the offer, Toby drops a chandelier on her. Damn, Toby has no chill. Robbie sees this and says he does not like you filming us. Really, Robbie? Because I have three movies that prove otherwise. The next night, there seems to be a party at Robbie's house. And Alex goes to check it out. But when a lady shows up and says, Hi, welcome to Chili's, she leaves. The next night after that, Robbie asks Wyatt, Hey, do you want to see him? And Robbie's like, Yeah, sure. But little did he know that his room becomes a mess. And now there's drawings all over him. But it seems to work because we get a throwback to three with Wyatt having a conversation in front of the camera to Toby. Alex discovers the triangle circle symbol on the back of Wyatt and she goes to look it up to see what it could mean. This is where we get our demon dump, you know, it's not a ghost, it's a demon, oh, firstborn male, blah, 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 since this was the very first thing that came up on Google. And I'm calling bullshit, bullshit. It's 2011, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows is out, that symbol is number one on Google, not some evil cult. Ooh. There the night the mom is making dinner and a knife flies up into the ceiling. And I gotta give a Lemmy for this because this automatically gives us anxiety for anyone who is in front of that camera moving forward. The next day, Wyatt and Robbie go to Robbie's house and they're playing. And Alex goes to pick them up. And when she does, she turns around and a sudden Katie appears. And I'm glad I had a good crowd for this because when she showed up, my whole entire theater went, ooh, like the whole momentum and shift and tone just changed. And, you know, we all knew the mom was Katie, but then finally seeing her and still getting that reaction, knowing who the mom was, to me, that is good execution. There that night, the dad hears some noises in the kitchen. He's thinking it's the laptop, but we all know it's Toby. And this is where we get the payoff to that knife setup. Wow. Really? That was the setup? That, that's what we were building up to. The next day, we find out why it is adopted because Katie told him that his other family needs him back. Which would explain why Katie says he looks just like his mother meeting Christy. Because he is Hunter. And wow, this is just created the most convoluted plan of any cult. The whole point of the second movie, right, was to abduct Hunter. Hell, the whole entire trilogy so far was about abducting Hunter in the future. Knowing it was inevitable. 
because the second movie was all about, oh, well, he wants Hunter. And the first movie was just, you know, filler, pretty much, to get back to that house to abduct Hunter. And the third movie is explaining, like, yeah, they need firstborn sons and all that. And this is why Hunter is going to be born, so Toby can take care of him, right? Now, why would they give him up? They got him in the second movie. Why give him up? Why give him to another family? This is the most mind-boggling plan ever. This whole movie here is just because movie. That night, Toby breaks the news to Wyatt that his real name is in fact Hunter. And I gotta give a lemme here to kinda seeing Toby again walking towards Wyatt. If it is Toby. Because Wyatt is talking to someone, obviously. But we also see the ghost, or demon, walking towards him. And absolutely creepy. I absolutely love that. We then get the paranormal bathroom scene. And another lemme. Because there's no mirror. I don't see a small mirror. And if I don't see it, it's not real. So let me. Then Wyatt gets pushed underwater for a very long period of time. And then he comes up and he's not possessed. They just pulled him underwater. But why? I, I would have gave a Lemmy if we would have got possessed Wyatt. But no, they just did it for the sake of being creepy. And it really didn't do much for me. There that night, while well, the parents are arguing about Alex taking a sleeping pill from her mother, Wyatt goes to Alex's room and watches her float up in the air. And man, I gotta say, this movie's got some problems, but it does a lot of cool and creepy stuff. That following night, Alex is left home alone with Wyatt. And to me, this is the best sequence of the movie. Uh, with Alex walking downstairs and then Katie stands up and we realize she's been on the couch the whole entire time. To, you know, she starts walking towards Alex, but then it goes back to the living room and she's gone. Like, oh, where did Katie go? And then Alex goes into the garage and gets locked in with Katie walking upstairs towards Wyatt. Toby turning the car on and Alex is gasping for air while Katie is talking to Wyatt like, hey, the time is now to uh, do this thing, my good man. And <laughs> it's just so creepy and good. And like, I actually really care about Alex, not just because of Catherine Newton, but I mean, Yes, the character is great. They actually wrote her good. She performs it very well. And it pays off with Alex bursting the car door open and backing out. And then we hear that the keys weren't even the ignition. She just drove out of it. And, man, I remember seeing that in the theater. And my theater clapped when she broke out. Like, it was like an Avengers-type level. Like, yes, she got out. So, yes, a lemmy for this sequence. The next day... The dad tells Alex, hey, I'm ready to listen. Let's go out to dinner. Let's let's talk about this. So this leaves the mom, Wyatt, and Katie home alone. And while Katie goes upstairs, Toby's like, you know what? I'm just going to fly the mom around. <laughs> she just goes flying. And he's just going wild now. And I absolutely love that. Toby deserves to go wild finally. Now they need to kill someone that we like. So Ben shows up. And Katie's like, you know what, Toby? Hey, I got this one. And snaps Ben's neck. When the dad and Alex arrive back home, they see Katie and Wyatt going across the street to Katie's house. And dad's like, yeah, no, that's kind of weird. So he goes to go check that out while Alex goes and checks inside to make sure everyone's okay. She can't find her mom, but when she gets to her room, she calls Ben. And his phone rings in her closet. And she's thinking he's pulling another prank on her. But it's really Toby who's doing the joking this time. And he pushes Alex outside the closet and drags her out of the room. And then we get a strange edit. Because then she just starts running across the street. Like, we're going to show it. We're going to show the strange edit. Like, we didn't edit the yank and then show her running across the street. No, that's actually in the movie. And I'm sorry, how did she get out of that and not die? Uh, the only thing that I can really see or think of that is believable is that they did have this big set piece of her getting dragged out and somehow fighting out of it and then grabbing the camera because she's using the infrared camera that they use for the connect. So I'm thinking like she gets dragged downstairs and then she fights out in the living room and then she grabs the camera and goes across the street. But it may have looked bad in post. So they're like, let's just cut it, cut it. We'll show her again, dragged and then just show her again across either way. It's a lining, but that's the only explanation I can think of.
We are now where Paranormal Activity does its best. We are in the finale. Alex runs into Katie's house, and she sees her dad getting flown around like a rag doll. And then Katie pursues her and attacks her to get her outside to wipe. Well, she turns the camera, and there's a bunch of witches everywhere. She turns the camera, Katie attacks her, movie ends. This ending here is not as strong as the previous three, but it's still a great build of tension because we actually really care about Alex and we did not want her to die, but we knew it was in inevitable. Uh, although I'm not a huge fan of seeing a bunch of witches everywhere, but it's not worthy to give a limey for it. So I'm just going to focus on the ending overall and give a lemmy for that. Hero Activity 4 felt like a movie that was just rushed and put together just to make another Paranormal Activity movie. But in some ways, it is still pretty entertaining. As for the message of this movie, I really can't think of one. Uh, I guess listen to your kids from the parents' perspective. But honestly, the only thing this movie really seems to preach is don't adopt. Because if... Alex's family doesn't adopt Wyatt, they don't die, and Robbie was also adopted, and, you know, they made him a weird kid, so, that's not a good lesson to learn, but that's the only lesson that I really see people can really take away from this movie, and every movie has a lesson. Our first of three standout performances goes to the absolutely non-believable recording. I only believed one thing that they recorded that I was like, yeah, a real family would record this, and that is the soccer game at the very beginning. Or football, depending on where you are. Ooh. Our second standout goes to Katherine Newton and Matt Shively. They are the only really enjoyable parts of this movie and make this movie somewhat entertaining. And thankfully, they are mostly in it, so most of it is entertaining. Our third standout performance is actually a split, and that is to the cadence of this movie. It starts off very slow. I mean, y'all saw me in the beginning making jokes about mugs and putt-putt and all of that. But then it really picks up once Robbie moves in and the activity actually begins. And then it slows down a little bit more when, you know, we have the whole adoption reveal. And then it really picks up again in the finale once they get to the uh, garage scene and all of that. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I'm going to give three points to Limey but two points to Lemmy. So this is how the lemon scale works. If I did not like the movie, it is a sour lemon. If I didn't like it, but hey, I could see people enjoying this, it is an exp expired store-bought lemonade. If I enjoyed it, but hey, there's a lot of problems, I could see why you wouldn't like it, it is a store-bought lemonade. If I liked it, hey, it's a movie, It it's good, it is a lemonade. If I really liked the movie with some minor problems here, it is a freshly squeezed lemonade. And if I think it's a 10 out of 10, one of the best movies ever, you have to see this now. It is a strawberry lemonade because to, to me, that's the best kind of lemonade. And with a score of 21 to 20, just barely winning Lemmy, that makes Paranormal Activity 4 a store-bought lemonade. I, I do enjoy the movie overall. Uh, Catherine Newman and Matt Shively really make the movie enjoyable for me. Just a lot of story problems with with the franchise as a whole, but if this was separate on its own, I think I think the movie does well, honestly. So, that'll be it for me, guys. Make sure to subscribe and like and comment and all that good stuff. Hope y'all enjoying this series, because next, next video, Paranormal Activity 5, The Marked Ones.